Okay, hi everybody. Uh, today's lecture is uh, integ integration testing REST services using Naka HTTP. Um, I'm Norm, I'm an architect at Twix. Uh, it's a Scala workshop, so everything is built with Scala t these days. And before I'm going to start with the topic ahead, I wanted to start with a different word, synergy. Uh, synergy is signaling for us that everything works together as, a, as an integrated unit. This is one of the things that is most important in the way that we work, because we all write code and everything is scattered around, but in the end we have to test that everything works together. Even as a community, uh, the things that I'll show ahead also is built on work that other people did, and it's very, it, it allows us to do a lot of things that, like, let's say, last year was impossible, but is, this year is just like five lines of code and everything is ready. Uh, in order to do that, we really have to, to be integrated properly. Even in the, in the company itself, as a, as a microservices-based company, um, your team does a, a splendid work, but it also needs to work with other team, and that contract needs to be validated. So everything in the end needs to work together, because doing together, doing stuff together, allows us to do bigger, a lot bigger, and a lot, uh, and give a lot more impact in the company. Uh, today we're going to have like a short intro on a little bit just of testing. I, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with. Uh, we'll show you how we test REST APIs, how we generate requests, how we validate the contract, and also how we use the t uh, test server. And let's start with a little bit engineering in Wix. I think the, the first thing that you hear when you come to work to Wix is that everything is t TDD. Everything is test driven. In a rapid development company, that, like a lot of the companies wish today, want to be more and more rapid, we realize that TDD is not just a methodology. It's also uh, the only way that allows us to keep on delivering more and more features. Uh, there are some issues with TDD, and there are lectures about that, but at the, at the end, it's the only thing that, uh, that currently works for us in order to be able to deploy more than, uh, more than a, every month or every, you can do it like every day and be sure and certain about your code. Another thing is, uh, that is uh, really uh, important for engineering is that we have a DevOps, DevOps culture, which means that you deliver stuff, you write them, you test them, and then if it breaks down in production, you're the one who's in charge of them. And this build it, or, uh, build it and maintain it method is the only thing that I found in my career that actually works. Otherwise, everybody is just like, uh, there's this team and that team, and in the end, everybody blames the network. Uh, and it's never the network's fault. <laughs> um, and of course, microservices. And microservices, uh, even though it's a very engineering kind of um, uh, phrase, it's, it's also affecting the culture in the company. And uh, it also affects the way that we build stuff. And if we're talking about testing or TDD, we all know this pyramid where um, most tests are unit and the rest of them are integration and end-to-end. For, for, for everything uh, that we build, first of all, it needs to be very, very unit-tested. Uh, integration tests actually validate that stuff works together. And end-to-end -end and component is, is kind of like a gray area where uh, each has his own how, what is a complete picture of. But today we're going to more, uh, we'll concentrate more about the integration tests. Um, and integration testing. One of the, let's uh, issue some guidelines on what do we do. Uh, we, first of all, we wish to test a ver an unchanged server, which means we don't change any of the mocks, we don't change any of the clients. So the server needs to start the same way it starts in production. Uh, we test usually because we can't test everything during integration. Well, we can, but we, we prefer not to. We test only sunny day uh, scenarios where we test the most uh, coverage of that specific API. Um, and one thing that 
makes us write less integration tests, it's because when you have an integration test, it's very difficult if it breaks down. Like we could test everything using integration. So you have a call going to the server, and then we can tell if it works or if it doesn't work. But if, first of all, it takes longer to start servers and to, to bring up the entire environment. But also, if something breaks down, we cannot be sure what it is. So it takes a lot of time to just find out what, what doesn't work. So for example, I can give uh, an example from my career where um, I had this back when I wasn't testing uh, using a TDD and, and like more advanced uh, uh, testing methods. I had this server that I added a specific code and it broke some test in a test suite, which was an integration test. And it took me about a week to investigate all the logs back in the day to understand in the end that the test wasn't the test wasn't testing anything in the end. So I invested uh, well, I think a week reading logs and more and more logs, and then I realized that for some reason my code changed some random things in the server, but the test was just testing that a specific value was changing. And when it changed, it changed with no affection to my code, and it wasn't broken, but the test was broken. So to write, to, to try to understand what's broken in your system once, it's, once it breaks and once you introduce changes, if you'll try to do it in integration testing, you can do it as, as I don't know, good as you can, but at, if you really need to understand what broke specifically, it's going to take me a while. And like again, validate, we, we really want to know that when we test the server, we can ship it to production after the tests are passing. And this is, this is what we're trying to do. Um, a, a little bit of, of how we do REST testing or how we did REST testing. We started with Apache HTTP. We had a client built on top of it. Uh, and then we discovered it was basic. It was also when we moved to Scala, we discovered Spray, which was a great client and server. Uh, and well, I wouldn't say unfortunately, but uh, it was uh, um, it was deprecated in 2013, and the uh, next successor would have been Aka HTTP. So we, the test client that we used to write on top of of, client, of uh, Spray, uh, we actually rewrote it entirely and open source since, uh, since day one. And this is one of the things that I'll, I'll show you a little bit later on. Uh, a little bit about Aka HTTP. Um, anybody using Aka HTTP here in production also? Oh, <laughs> less people. Um, so Aka HTTP has a very great uh, HTT model, HTTP domain, same as Spray uh, HTTP. They also added Java support, which is really nice. It has a great DSL. Uh, it's extremely fast. Starting a server with Aka HTTP is a matter of seconds or milliseconds, where in other platforms it takes more time. But uh, we don't use it currently in production. We have some reason for that. but. Um, uh, at the moment, we don't do that. Um, one of the things, like side notes, that I noticed while working with it is that this has a very a lot of very advanced stuff about streaming and 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 the non-blocking servers. So, if you want to experiment with that, it's very very nice. One thing that you need to know is that the documentation and Stack Overflow are not really your friends in this because. When I was looking for answers, usually it was very hard to find them. A lot of the time I found examples on the previous versions of Aka HTTP, and it sometimes is very difficult to actually understand what, what to do. Um, and you can, you, you can have a lot of issues. Like, for, for example, example, the first week we started using the new library, we discovered some issues with connections and uh, even I think in the, uh, in the, not last version, but it was like a 10, 0, uh, 11, or a, a, there was this bug in the connection that would start uh, dropping stuff. So you, you can fall, it, it's, it's still stable, but, uh, but use, it caution, use it with caution. Um, what, uh, there was also an issue with multiple consumer, but it's not something that we discussed right now. 
Um, and let's talk about API validation. Uh, we want to test uh, REST API and make sure that it's easy to test, it's easy to understand the, the contract that we're trying to do, and basically that allows us to concentrate on the code that we need to write and not on the test. So the first thing that it was, I think, the most important for us is to have a simple, as simple as API as we could. And I can, I can tell you how simple it is, but it's going to be easier just to show you. So this is just the start of a test. Everybody can see that, hopefully. Uh, so first thing that we want to do if we want to test a specific API, we just need to do, we just need to import the, the DSL. And there's also synchronous and asynchronous uh, if you want. And then all we need to do is just, just write what we're trying to do. In this case, it's just doing get. We have also all of the, all of the methods. And, and in this specific test, let's see, it will build for a second. We'll try to build it and we'll fail in a second. Because what I'm missing here is actually specifying which servers I'm talking to. So I'm just gonna import. I wrote a, a very small server and we'll just import the, well, it's a definition, his port and host, which is just a case class with the port number. And now, and now, ah, well, let's, because we don't have anything to match and specs to complain about it. And we have a test that tests something. So all the methods or everything that we're testing, now if you, if you want to see that your API works, all you need to just, you look at the test and you see exactly what it does. But response is, sending a request is very easy. We want to, we want to be able to send a little bit more than just a request because a request is, uh, is more complex than that. Uh, so we'll do get to some path. The server that I brought up is just uh, answering OK to everything I'll send it to. And now we want to just modify the request. So we'll say with parameters. And we'll send it a param with value something. And we also included, uh, we can chain those things together, so we can say with headers and also and also we, uh, we can have with cookies or with everything else. So everybody who looks at it, or even if we, if we want to post some, uh, let's say, a payload, if we want to do a, just a second, if we want to send a post request, then we can just say with payload and some payload that I wrote, which is also a case class. And that, what, what will happen here is that there is an option to include, if I try to compile it, it will complain that it cannot, uh, it cannot find uh, something that will marshal it to JSON or to whatever we want to do. So we can import just the default marshallers that we include in the test kit. And and sorry. Oh, it will complain again about. The test being not matching against anything. So this is, this is how we build a request and test it against our server, which is basically as simple 
as, as possibly uh, as possible for you. And creating a request, we're building it with, like you, like you saw, with transformation. Because this is one of the concepts that came from HTTP that allows us to chain a couple of transformation to create a request. The, the good thing about it is that, um, that it's reusable. So if, for example, you're using uh, a specific chain that creates something, it's very easy to share it to another project. Uh, I'll show you an example of it. It, with this example. Is for example, uh, you have a DSL, uh, the request number that says, with site ID and gives that specific value of the parameters. How many of you try to replace a parameter across the system? Usually it takes a lot of time. So if you use just one, one request, build the custom handlers for you, and just told it that, that I'm not sending a parameter, but I'm sending a site or a site ID, the implementation itself, the site ID or legacy site ID, is very, uh, it's, it's going to be written only once. So writing stuff like this also makes your test a little bit more readable. Like, for example, you see get with some path, and you obtain it with site and site ID. And then everywhere across the, the board, everywhere across of your, of your API, you will know that, that you're sending uh, th that specific parameters. And if tomorrow you want to change legacy site ID, which was a bad name in the first place, don't call that parameter, uh, but you want to change it to site ID, all you need to do is just change one handler and then everything on top of across of all of your system is going to be validated with the same thing. Having a test framework that allows you to have some, such flexibility and allows you to write your code in a way that's very easy to later on maintain, because maintaining tests is actually even more difficult than maintaining uh, production code, then if, if it allows you to do it and you can write your tests like this, it's going to be easier for you later on. But again, what we're testing is contract. I told you, I, I, you, show how, you saw how I'm just sending a request, but sending a request doesn't allow you to do, it's just sending a request. We need to validate the contract. And how do we validate the contract? Matches. Anybody not familiar with matches here? Using, not using? Show your hand. No. <laughs> uh, so, so just, just like, like a quick brief-through, brief it's, it's a predicate that allows you to write uh, rules, and it allows your verification code to be very simple, and it provides default failure, uh, uh, detailed failure information. Uh, the metro frameworks that, uh, that currently that I'm familiar with is that the spec two, which if anybody if you listen to Eric today knows, and also Scala test. And what's nice is that we provide test uh, request measures for both of them. So I'll show you how we, how we test a contract. So for example, my server currently is accepting uh, is accepting um, echo on a parameter and returns a specific parameter. So what we'll do here is we'll do a get echo param and we'll send it with a parameters. It's going to be param equal something. And now we want to match it, so we're doing like specs must. And so I'll be successful, because this, this is a successful, oh, wait, I'll need to import the matchers first. So we do import request. Be successful. Um, my mistake. Different set of matchers. All you need to do is say that it's P success full with con with something 
Because this is what our test is going to test. It's going to test that I'm sending in a parameter with value param, and uh, uh, w the parameter name is param, and I'm sending in some text, and here he's returning it back in the body. So you can see that testing something like that is very simple. We also have the same thing with header. I wrote the server to answer. So the second request will send a header with a specific value and then validates it, it returns it in the response. Ah. Oh, internal error. With with ah, right. Thanks. And now it will pass. And of course, you can you, you can also have we can test a very a lot. Of, there are a lot of matches. Like for example. You can do uh, also test other statuses, like if I'm sending this response would be, this will also uh, this will return uh, for the non not found URL, it will return a 404, and we can test it with also with that. So there are a lot of things that you can do around, and you can play with it, but, but the most important thing is that when you look at a test that's written like this, You, it's very, very obvious what you're testing. You realize exactly what your API that you're testing with, and it's very, very simple to write. You can write in a simple, a few lines of code, you can actually write a very complicated contract. So let's do a short recap. We, we generate requests with transformers, which, is where, which allows us more flexibility and reusable code, and we have matches, uh, a match suite that will allow us to validate all the responses that we get. And this is, this is what the, the client side validation. The, but clients are not the only thing. There are servers also in, in, in the works, and our server doesn't work alone. So the most important thing when we're testing stuff or when we're testing our specific server is the isolation part. We want our server to be isolated. We don't want it to be uh, affected by other things. And the, the this is the guidance that we follow in order to be able to test stuff and, and move faster. So our tests run locally on a laptop, just a laptop, with no network, with no nothing. It needs to run on a laptop. I know that uh, this is a very, uh, where some people may think that there is always internet available, but there isn't. You can fly in the airport, you can have your uh, local provider shut down your internet because you forgot to pay the bill or stuff like that. So you want to be able to run it even if you're in a bomb shelter. Um, the way that we, that we support it is that microservices internally usually supply some sort of a test kits, those test kits. Uh, are based on IDLs, this is the way that we work today, is that we, we express the contract between the services with IDLs, uh, and we provide some sort of a fake, fake server to allow you to, uh, to run them. Um, and that works for us, but, but what happens with, if you're working with an external server? Everybody, if anybody's working with Google or with another Amazon or whatever, and you want your tests to run, uh, sometimes it's very complex, and some of them actually provide some sandbox, uh, sandbox environment. Sometimes we just give another authorization key, we open a, a sandbox account, and we run stuff against it. I personally don't uh, think it's, it's good, but what it gives us is basically you can test online that everything works, but you need to be online. You can't be without any internet. Uh, that, the test applies the sandbox configuration and then you run it against it. And, and if something uh, is breaking, then next time you run the test, you'll see that it's broken. But let's look at the, at the, word, at the bad side. Uh, first of all, you have to be online. 
And, and if you provide some sort of a sandbox environment for your users or for anything that develops, anybody develops against something against your API, then you always have to be available. You cannot have like your sandbox environment crashing, so you have another server to, to, to take care of. And I think the most important thing is that it doesn't give you any more certainty because your contract is being validated only when the build is running. So if, for example, you have something that works against uh, Google and Google or some payment provider or whatever, and that payment provider decided that he wants to delete all of the V1 API today and forgot to mention it, or he mentioned it like two years ago and then one day they pull off the plug. When do you think you'll know about it? It depends. If you have your tests running all the time, then you might hit it, but usually you'll hit it in production. So it doesn't really give you more certainty. And, and finding stuff in production is not something that we all like to discover. We prefer to discover during build time. So this is why we prefer local servers, why we run all those local servers. So it, some, one, one we have, when we have those things, it's not an online dependency, it becomes a build dependency. So if something changes in the build, your build is triggered and your contract is being validated over again. Uh, also, if you provide that, that sort of a server or a test server that someone can play with, you can actually have it uh, uh, using a different behavior. Like for example, if you want to delete your V1 API, and you don't want to do it in production for, so people will get heard about it, then all you need to do is just delete it in your test kit or even have the, the, the server, your fake server, just returning errors or printing warnings saying you're using deprecated API and it's going to be deleted someplace else. This is something that an online server cannot do. And, and also, if anybody's familiar with chaos engineering and resilient testing, you can actually have we can actually have support in your server, expose it to your users, saying what happens if the server responds in two minutes instead of two millis, or if it just doesn't respond at all. Those are things that you can test against a local server, and you cannot test against an online one. So I'm, I'm, I set up a, like a really short example on how we do that, and the way that we, I, I wrote this, Google Translate, anybody integrated with Google Translate here? Anyway, it's, got, it's, not a, it's not a very difficult API. I wrote the, the code itself that just does like this simple contract is this. I have a map, a mutable map. I can deposit value in it. Um, and I have an API that does translate that just takes stuff from the map. So I have an in-memory mock translation server. So, and I actually even wrote a test for it, which is this one. And what it does, it gives the server translation for the word. Some it translated to some translated and thing it translated to thing underscore translated. And what I'm calling here is Google service. Google service actually is using Google code. It's not my code. It's a fat client provided by Google. And all I want to know is that uh, when I'm calling the translate API on the client, I'm sorry, if you can't see as in, I'm calling the, the translate API with some word that I have, some word that I doesn't, don't have, and I expect to see a list of the things that was translated. This is a very, this is, should be a simple test. Um, I'm gonna run it. No, I'm not running something else right now. So the server would probably hang and wait for a timeout because there is nothing to respond. So what I need to do is use, um, I'm using our frameworks to, to build uh, a mock server and we're gonna do it here. How are we gonna do it? First of all, we're gonna do web surf. 10 minutes, okay. 
So I have a mock server with, and I program some behavior in it. I'm going to do a dot build. Just a second. What's going on with it? <laughs> server dot start start and server dot stop and now we have this would start the server so now we need to program the behavior of Google Translate into it and programming and uh, the behavior in it is just writing a handler that specific request. So I pre-built some of the things here, and because I, I don't think I have enough time, uh, I'm going to show you how it's done. I'm just going to show you the <coughs> response itself. So. So what I'm doing here is I'm um, doing, I program the API that uh, I program the API that uh, that Google is using, which is it's waiting for a GET request. It's checking if it's if the path is correct. So if if it's accessing, oh, I think I'll. So it's going to check that the path is to the correct path. Then it's going to parse the query, query, and rec and recover all of the words in it. So it will take um, the query and it will take all of the values with Q in them, which is the Google API, and would just give them to me. And once I get that, all I need to do is just call translate. And for some reason, that is still red. So I'm going to stop and start the server. So once we, once we translate, we're using the Google API to actually translate it, and then we return it marshaled back as JSON to the client. This test will pass in a second. Oh, no, just uh, I need to update the base URI with it. So it's going to be... So we have this, we have Google API now talking to our server. And when we do that now, the test will pass. So 
here the server started and everything is passing. So writing, writing, the, writing an external server that has a very complex uh, logic, I'm sorry if nobody, if, is at the end just writing six or seven lines of code. And Google Translate is quite a complicated server, but still to just emulate it for your test is very simple. And now all of the APIs that you're testing against, you can actually tell them, uh, to, you can actually verify a lot of extremes, cases, which you couldn't do with a normal server. So creating the server is just one line, and then programming a behavior into it is, is also simple. Those, those mock servers are used very basically for large integration issues. If you have an integration with external services, it's better. It, it's, it will respond 404 for any unregistered un behavior, and uh, it will allow you to add more custom handlers. But some cases, you need more, you need even more flexibility. For example, uh, this is why we supply another type of server, which is, um, which is a stub that will allow, this is, the this is the server that I demonstrated the first demo with it. It will respond with, uh, it's used for unit tests, and it responds everything by 200, and it records all, the, all of the requests that it's getting, uh, and also allows you to add custom responses. So to demonstrate this, I created this example, which is, which is uh, even more complex. We have two servers here. Server one is getting a, re a request, waiting 200 milis, and then triggers a call to, to, uh, to the other server, but it automatically responds. So to, to, uh, to actually find that, to actually emulate it, we actually have to have some sort of a matcher that will test that the, ser the external server will get that call. So that once we issue this call, test get, we'll get to the first server, that call would be delayed, the response would automatically wait. So if, if we'll write this code, if we'll have, everybody can see that? If we'll have like a, a test that actually validates something synchronously, we would have failed. So, and if we'll run it, we'll see that we fail. I'm sorry. But now with the, and we're validating the contract from the other server using a, another match suite that allows you to see if a request is got. So for example, server two, we're waiting for server two to get uh, a response, so receive a response that is a matcher. And only, all we need to, all we're testing here is that the test, the response is get. We also have probably, we also have, and with path, with params or a lot of, a lot of uh, other things we can validate the contract. And if we run this test right now, then we'll see, first of all, those two servers starting and the test will pass. If you notice, starting up two servers with Aka HTTP takes you about like, I don't know, less than a milli. So this is probably a very complex test scenario that used to be written like in a lot of lines of code, but right now you can do it like in about four or five lines of code, which is, to my taste, it's like it, it allows me to concentrate on the things that I really want to program. The server matches that I, get, that I show you also support uh, Specs2 and Scala tests. It allows you to validate all of aspects of requests and with this, I'll conclude. I'll just do a short recap on what we saw right now, that when we're testing REST services, we're doing that uh, locally. So no servers, no network is involved. Uh, mock servers test complex integration or more programmable servers. 
stop servers using for smaller unit tests. And by the way, I have tests here that's running, uh, that's starting about like 16 servers or 18 servers, and it usually takes less than like 10 millis. Uh, I, although I don't encourage you to write, sir, to write all of your code as integration, but still the ability to be able to, like for, for example, I'm using unit tests to actually validate a specific contract. If I want to test something against Google Translate, then I'll start to, I don't know, send 500 or send so many errors and see how my server responds, and I can actually run them as a unit test. So each one of the test cases will start a new server, each one of those will validate a specific aspect and it will allow you to be more robust later on. So it's, 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 very, it's very nice to have that ability. And if you're interested in actually playing around with it, uh, everything, it's all also open source. So I'll be more than happy to get feedbacks and, and I don't know, curses or why isn't stuff working. And there are a lot of other aspects that I didn't have right time to go into. And with this, I'll conclude. So I'm, uh, I'll be happy if you want. I'm walking around here. You can ask me questions or just comment or open an issue if it's interesting for you. And thank you. <laughs>